Welcome to One Word Stories. <laughs> There you go. Yes. Merci beaucoup. Merci uh, beaucoup. Today's uh, episode number seven, numéro sept, avec Laure Cohen van Delft. And I'm really, really pleased to host you today. Bonjour, Laure. Good evening. Bonjour. Good morning, <laughs> depending yes. on the time zone. <laughs> True. Bonjour, Joanna. Ça me fait. <laughs> Un immense plaisir. Oh oui, moi aussi. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's really fantastic, you know, to mingle languages. And I'm such a big fan of talking to you because whenever we meet virtually, we actually have this chance to mingle languages. <laughs> Alors, euh, parler français ou même anglais, ça dépend de, du journée, n'est-ce pas, de la journée. <laughs> And... When I was thinking how to introduce you, I thought of really three most important things. First of all, uh, when I think of lore, I immediately think of appreciative inquiry. Mm -hmm. And yes. this is uh, what is really wonderful in the intercultural context as well. So I'm really, really looking forward to our conversation also in this context. Second of all, I remember that one of our exchange brought us closer to having a lens on the female leadership. Mm -hmm. So what it actually means uh, for a woman to lead across cultures. And third of all, when I think of lore, I immediately think of art. <laughs> ah, wow. <laughs> I'm honored. <laughs> so, Laura, who is Laura? <laughs> Because after my introduction, people are having so many ideas what you are capable of doing and offering. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us more. <laughs> oh, that's so, so difficult to answer. But you know, the first answer that comes to mind is one of the workshops I went to with yourself, with you. Okay. And that was when you introduced us to a painting from Manet. Yeah. And there was uh, this nude that is centerpiece, but in the very, not even the background, but very close is this black maid. Yeah. And her name is Laure. Exactly, yeah. Mm. And that, can you imagine that I am French speaking as you've well said, that I went to Musée d'Orsay many times. I never knew that mm -hmm. she was a Laure too. Yeah. And I was so happy, it made my day. <laughs> so um, so that uh, maybe that's an angle. It says a lot about me already uh, in terms of uh, curiosity. Uh, and yes, you're, you're right, the, uh, the curiosity for artists in particularly uh, art uh, in terms of poetry and uh, paintings. That's, yes. So enough said of myself. That's an angle. That's an interesting <laughs> angle. Everybody is so multifaceted that it's always hard to, to say in a few words, a one word story, as you like to say, who we are. Yes, exactly. Yes. So, Laure, um, when you were talking about uh, this Manet paintings, uh, Olympia, yeah, Rare. it was exactly the uh, big surprise uh, I actually also experienced because me, myself, I've been to Musée d'Orsay many times as well, and I really love it. It's one of my favorite museums. And I never knew that her name was Laure. And mm. just because of the exhibition 2019, when the curators decided to change the title of the picture and just to say, okay, it's not only depicting Olympia, the main character, but also Lore, her mate, as you have said, uh, it has changed the entire story. Yeah. So how actually we can really be kind of playful with re-narrating in a very constructive and sometimes even shaking way. And how can we actually use stories to reframe and, uh, as you say in French, in a beautiful way, recadrer? Mm -hmm. 
So, um, for sure, um, recadrer, let me just, just uh, have an interesting point of view on recadrer in French, since you mention it. Uh, as you know, I live in Montreal and in Canada, uh, the French Canadian is a little uh, in its expressions different from the French who have some kind of uh, puritanism on certain words. Yeah. So as, as, why, as I was talking to my, my sister about our interview and even the whole concept of reframing, yeah. which in English opens the door to so many possibilities. When I said recadrer in French to my sister who lives in France, she said, oh, that doesn't sound very positive to me. Mm -hmm. So I said, wow, why not? Mm -hmm. And she said, because when I use that word, it's about putting someone back into his place. Oh, really? Wow. Mm -hmm. So in French, she suddenly, yes, uh, made me think about ways that I've heard it more in France. It was around, you know, a kid who's not doing what he's supposed to do, and you recadre that person, you put him back into his track, oh, yeah. into his place. Mm -hmm. And that is absolutely not the mindset that I had, but it just made me realize the subtlety of the languages mm -hmm. and how the narratives can be different, especially if you don't ask. Yeah. Because if I had just told her, this is my topic of interest, she would continue thinking that, you know, I'm in the mindset of putting people back into place. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and my mindset, it's the English, I think, way. I don't know, in German, maybe you could compare because, uh, because you, you are more than trilingual, I'm sure. But I don't know, in English, it is full of possibilities. And for me, it's really about how you zoom things. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay. Yes. That's already a narrative yeah. where we're biased. Mm -hmm. And just because of the lens she took, so I had to go back to the dictionary <laughs> and, and, and figure that out and double check. And indeed, the word in French can mean many other things. But mm -hmm. still, it was interesting to see that in the common language, it could be biased towards educating people, uh, educating, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. actually, when we, when we talked about it, what was this most important word for you 2020, yeah. you mentioned exactly uh, this one. So to reframe, recadre. Uh, so what is the meaning behind for you especially? And what is the story behind? <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, mm, for me, it really started with... Uh, a painting in mind and how an artist will have his own point of view and try to zoom you into something. And I think the example you gave about Olympia is really rich in metaphors because the way the name was Olympia and just by changing the name to Olympia and Laure, maybe. Actually, Some only Laure, even. Yeah. Even Laure. Mm. So automatically, you zoom into another uh, personnage yeah. who is as important, but maybe you hadn't noticed that personnage because of your own perspective or maybe bias, unknown bias. So for me, reframing is really about deconstructing mm. and reconstructing. And deconstructing can be at many levels. It can be at the level of the language, the word, as we saw in French. Yeah. Uh, it c and as we saw in the naming of the, the, of the exhibition or of the painting, suddenly it deconstructs and then reconstruct another narrative. Yeah. So when you ask me about reframing, what's the story behind it? It really is around the curiosity to think a little out of the box, out of the frame, and then put it back into suddenly another frame. Why do I do that? Because I've 
learned through childhood and life that when I do that, suddenly I feel more joyful. I feel there's a end of the road somewhere. I'm not in a tunnel vision. So it's for me, it's a survival way of looking at life. It really is a mindset. And the more I practice, the I think the kinder I become, mm -hmm. even towards people, because I can suddenly have this reflex of maybe reframing what I think. Yeah, yeah. So it has a lot of ripple effects. Once you uh, start a practice of really zooming in to different aspects of things. And yes, the appreciative inquiry, which you were referring to before, is a very uh, good place to start because it starts with discovery and reframing a theme. So there mm -hmm. you go. Yes, yes. So, you know, when I think of um, this, what you have just said, uh, and also the, our example from this uh, exhibition in Musée d'Orsay, uh, Le Modèle Noir, um, it's also about having a new spotlight. Yeah? yeah. So really focusing on something that hasn't been noticed so far, on something that maybe, uh, just like in this case, is a little bit vulnerable because, of course, we are talking about, you know, renaming, re uh, narrating the story of this uh, picture, of this uh, particular picture in the context of the raising racism and also how to deal with it. When I think of one more context, uh, which is also very, very vulnerable and uh, gives also one idea how actually we can, you know, see the power of renaming and also re-narrating its action that was taken after World War II regarding the survivors of the Holocaust and Shoah. So for many, many years, even decades, they were called the victims. Mm. The moment they started to be called survivors, it changed the entire narrative. Yeah, so it also brings us to this uh, very, very important uh, aspect of the l'approche appréciative, so mm -hmm. appreciative inquiry, that words create worlds. How we actually use words uh, changes the feelings, changes emotions, how we relate to different events uh, at the individual and collective level. Mm -hmm. And right now, the question to you, Laura, uh, what brought you to appreciative inquiry uh, and uh, why do you work with this approach in the organizational context? I have been working as a business coach for the past 20 years and uh, as a facilitator always without naming it a facilitator, I guess. <laughs> um, and I've worked with many different organizational uh, work frames or frames until I found out about the appreciative inquiry. First of all, the two words together were intriguing. And I was thinking, what does that mean? And how does, because I believe in appreciation, I believe in inquiry how do these two words put together can help an organization because i work with organizations implement change so i was curious about that and then i also noticed that this same uh, frame would work at a nation uh, level between conflicts between nations so i thought let's go and see what it is and as soon as I sat down and that I saw the simplicity of it and the cycle around it, I felt it was a natural to work with because it is mm -hmm. flexible enough to incorporate many different aspects of your personal life or your professional life, 
or uh, an organization or a country. And it is also, uh, so it's flexible and still is a structure to look at a problem. So that's what attracted to that. And I was looking all my life for a framework that would be adaptable and reflect my values of appreciation for what is mm -hmm. and the potential and the life giving of many aspects that we have and the curiosity and the listening and those two aspects come into place in this uh, approach yeah yeah thank you thank you very much it also you know immediately gives an idea how we can actually incorporate more of it uh, in the storytelling con uh, concept so to say and right. also practices because when i think of working with story circles what happens pretty often is that people are encouraged to share stories when something um, negative happened and of course of, you know from this very basic definition of a story we've got a story only when there is the beginning the conflict the struggle and the end yeah this is the story otherwise it's just you know nice description what has happened within the uh, last decades is actually that uh, very very many practitioners uh, really focused on the conflict Right now, when we change the lens, just like you are saying, you know, just to reframe and focus more on this, what went well and what actually worked well, um, it opens completely different possibilities. What was the best example for you or maybe the most powerful example when you are working with the appreciative inquiry in the corporate context yeah. uh, in terms of transformation? Yeah, uh, yeah. The, thanks for the question, because it allows me to build on what you just said. So the yes and mm -hmm. is a really important aspect of the appreciative inquiry, because it's always around uh, the improvisation, the listening in the moment, so you can build on what someone said. Mm -hmm. And you said something really interesting around positivity. And I just want to make a comment around positivity, because of course, when you listen to appreciative, you, you have the link with positive, but in a way, the appreciative inquiry, I'll turn it around completely and tell you that the value, most of the value of the appreciative inquiry comes in hard times, mm -hmm. in difficult times. Why use appreciative inquiry if if there's no issue or no hardship, mm -hmm. the real value comes when there is hardship, when there is a struggle, when there is a conflict, when something is not working. Mm -hmm. So uh, example, COVID times was an excellent moment in history to look at the uh, this through the appreciative inquiry lens and ask ourselves hard questions which would allow to turn around this uh, covid into something that could be life giving mm -hmm. so to go back to your question uh the, one of the examples i would have in terms of organizations would be if i'm called in to work on the collaboration or the lack of collaboration between two departments or even worse a conflict between two departments the title of our meeting could be resolving the conflict fine that's a classic and we're going to diagnose this and understand who does what and what's the history and all that the appreciative inquiry lens will not put the conflict into a positive uh, event, mm -hmm. quite the opposite. It will just allow people to reframe what is a conflict. So it's a provocative thought, such as what if a, pro uh, a conflict was uh, productive? Mm -hmm. What is a productive conflict? Mm -hmm. And that's where the discussion starts. So nobody has a ready-made answer because we never thought about putting those two words together, maybe. 
and we're going to go into the first step, which is the discovery mode. I'm mm -hmm. going to interview you and ask you, when was your experience? When was a story? When was a moment in time you experienced a productive conflict? Mm -hmm. So you're going to go back in the past and find out that oh, you did live through a conflict that turned out somehow into something that you could work with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you take that into the future, which becomes your dream, which is the second phase. So how do you then build a prototype so that your team can go from where it is now into thinking that it's a conflict to a productive conflict and then implementing it? Mm -hmm. So those are the simple steps. The discovery mode because you've reframed the problem the dream of where you want to go the prototype what are the actionable items around that and then the deployment where do i take responsibility to make it work it goes surprisingly fast as long as you connect at the beginning in yeah. terms of the discovery and the interview process of listening to what's the story of the other person Mm -hmm. So when I listen to you, it's really, uh, first of all, working with stories in this classical way. So there is always, you know, the beginning of the story, the conflict, the struggle, the, the yeah, something mm -hmm. that is happening and uh, the shaking the sure. participants and then also the end. And the appreciative inquiry lens uh, is about really, uh, as you have said, reframing the context and the questions so that people don't focus on the negative aspects but really on this constructive way with working with for example the struggle and the conflict so that they are able to make sense uh, out of the stories they? yeah they discover mm -hmm. they discover a as uh, leonard cohen said um there's a uh, there's a crack in everything mm -hmm. That's where the light gets in. Yeah. So I'm trying to find where the light gets in mm -hmm. for that conflict. I don't know the answer, yeah. but I trust that within the group, if we go through this appreciative process, we will find the crack because it is a crack and we will find the light that gets in. Yeah, yeah. Th th that is that is the real description of appreciative inquiry yeah yeah so again when i listen to you i can relate to it very very well from my experience with working with story circles yeah? mm -hmm. uh, so that uh, actually people are asked to uh, reflect upon what they have heard and they are asked uh, to reflect upon what they have shared because whatever story we share, uh, it really depends uh, on the context, how we share it. And we never, ever tell the same story twice the same way. You're right. Yeah. yeah. That's so true. the point is actually, especially in the intercultural context, because we live in the globalized world and also, of course, in the VUCA world, extremely volatile, uh, uncertain, complex and ambiguous. And uh, so the question is actually how is it possible to uh, give this participants um, the gift of story listening because you know what happens in our brains very very often is that we listen uh, to immediately to react we will we listen through our own cultural perspective of course through our own cultural lens and what actually is required both in story circles and in the appreciative inquiry approach is stories uh, listening for understanding isn't it as soon as you come into a room you go into discovery mode you don't go into the thinking cerebral uh, thinking yeah. you go into to conversation storytelling and that's where my job is to before as a preparation build a conversation guide we call it an interview guide mm -hmm. and the interview guide is very structured in a way that 
there are maybe three questions. One person asks the question and then does not talk, just writes down what the person just said. So the three questions are open-ended question, of course, mm -hmm. going back to an experience where someone had uh, an experience around conflict, maybe around productive conflict, and listening to the words they use, to the story they tell. And you don't interrupt, and it's really a timed activity. So you have maybe five minutes to listen. You go on to the second question, five minutes to listen, and then there's a third question, maybe. You write down. Once you've written down the words, the other person gets to ask you the same questions. And guess what happens at the end of the process after 20 minutes, 10 minutes for me, 10 minutes for you? We compare our notes. Mm. And suddenly we find out that we have a lot in common. And by the way, the pairs we were put into are random pairs. Yeah. So maybe I never spoke to you before. So having that proposed, then you get into a listening mode that you've never had before. Because the rules are timing, mm -hmm. random pairs, listen and share. Yeah. And then you get into a forum together and you find out that your experience of listening to the other compares really to the experience of the other person who had the same aha moment. Ah, she's not so different than myself. Mm -hmm. So this is where the listening skills are very much used and worked on so that when you go through the other phases, people have caught on the habit and the power of listening. So it's a practice. It's almost a warm up. Wonderful, isn't it? Can you imagine what would I, happen? I tell you, people... it, is, <laughs> it is. I've done it several times, and every time seeing the wonder, the awe in mm. people. Ah. Oh. She said the words I would use. And you know, I'll send you a video. Uh, I don't have it handy, but it's, I, it was done, I think, in Belgium. The same type of interview between people who had drastically different opinions on, I think, the Brexit. Mm -hmm. And they got together and spoke on Zoom uh, in that very same way. And they became not... Uh, on the same opinion, but they listened to each other and had a perspective that was completely different at the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah so this is uh, really about the beauty and also the challenge to create such spaces, not only face to face, but as you have just emphasized also in the virtual space, that people have got the chance Uh, to really uh, slow down, share their perspectives uh, in this appreciative way. And uh, all in all, uh, I can confirm it many, many times, discover that they have so much in common. Yeah, which is, uh, which after you've practiced enough times becomes almost second nature. Yeah. So when you meet someone who triggers you, because they say something that's really not appropriate for you, yeah. uh, suddenly you kind of begin the process of listening in a different way so that you can continue the conversation. I think we can change the world that way. Yeah. It, it really has the power to change so many conversations Yeah. Yes. Definitely. around so many different topics. Yes, definitely, yes. And what is really wonderful about it is that it's also possible currently in our situation in the virtual space. Yeah. This is also, you know, how we uh, met. And uh, it's uh, such a gift because, you know, many, many people 
uh, keep, uh, let's say, telling this narrative, oh, back to normal, back to face to face, and so on and so forth. Of course, of course, we miss this social context a lot. Nevertheless, when we again reframe and focus on the positive in the negative, namely that, for example, it's possible to uh, communicate across cultures and across uh, countries. Right. Uh, yeah, and really to break this time zone differences. And uh, just like in one of um, programs I've been offering, having a participant from Chile at five o'clock in the morning and from Japan and South Korea at five o'clock in the afternoon, when in Europe we had nine o'clock uh, in the morning. Yeah. So, you know, this is also something you remember when you also participated in the vis a vis art adventures. Uh, that uh, people just uh, share their stories on what they see, inspired by different pieces of art, and it automatically also creates these moments of uh, curiosity and exchanging similarities. Yeah? And differences. And differences, well, Because of differences occur and are perceived suddenly as a gift. Exactly. And in this context, it can be perceived as an enrichment because mm -hmm. suddenly we see completely yeah. different possibilities of interpretation. Completely Absolutely. Different Why would I even want to spend time with people who think like me? Yes. That's not <laughs> the way to change. It really is. The appreciative inquiry is all about being curious about people who do not think like you. Yeah. And still, um, we know from research that many, many managers um, employ people for the so-called cultural fit, so that mm -hmm. they employ mm -hmm. people who are very much alike like them. Mm -hmm. So what has to actually happen, Laura, <laughs> that uh, we appreciate much, much more this uh, cultural differences and really search for different perspectives and different points of view and don't perceive it as uh, challenging so much, but really as a huge enrichment and possibility to involve this uh, cultural diversity and diversity in general uh, to invite more innovation, to invite more creativity. It's a big question, but I, I love the way you framed it. what uh, has to happen mm -hmm. in order for people to tap into the richness. So that's a way of reframing the question of intercultural differences that could put us apart. But on the opposite, the way you ask the question, that's why appreciative inquiry says one of the premises, questions are never neutral. Mm. So the way you frame the question, what has to happen? I love that question. Mm. What has to happen? And if you build a conversation around that question and not uh, uh, how can we uh, what and not the opposite of, of you know, uh, how do we make people work better together? It's already implying that they're not working well together. Exactly. Or, mm. You see, but yeah. what has to happen? What can we make happen? You know, suddenly mm. it's life giving and I want to answer those questions and I'm not taking it personally. Yeah. And then if I interview someone, they will give me answers that kind of I can build on. Yes. And, mm. and then when she interviews me, I, she can build on what I say. And suddenly we find out that we can build things together and we don't even have to rationalize anything. Yeah. 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 Wonderful. I, I love your approach. I love also uh, with uh, how much passion you talk about. It. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I definitely found it was late. I'm a late bloomer. <laughs> it was late in my life, but I finally found, you know, my my uh, my way of expressing, I guess, mm -hmm. and my belief, my deep mission, I think. Yeah, wonderful. So, Laura, I wish you lots of beautiful moments uh, in the corporate world when you app uh, apply appreciative uh, inquiry, but also in your personal life you. uh, to reframe uh, different stories so that you can blossom, you can flourish. <laughs> 
that's another story but you're absolutely right you have to use it in all walks of life it is definitely not cast in stone and yes i do use it in my personal life it it is of a immense tremendous uh, benefit mm. wonderful wonderful it's a material for one more conversation i guess <laughs> definitely with pleasure with pleasure so Anna, it's really a a um, always a discovery journey to talk with uh, someone who has so many interests and who can build links i love the way uh you work in that sense of building art with conversation and storytelling it really is my belief as well yeah yeah especially in this intercultural field you know yeah. where uh, there are so many assumptions so many judgments so many bias so that really uh, actually we have just one opportunity to uh, dive deeper and to get to know each other better way and this is through stories yeah hmm. thanks thank you very much thank you laura thank you very much